You are listening to KZSC's Voces Críticas, Critical Voices. I am your host, Silvana Falcone. Today, I am in the studio with Professor Alan Christie. Alan Christie is an associate professor of history, specializing in modern Japan, and provost of Cowell College. Raised in Boston, Massachusetts, he earned his BA in history at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, and his PhD is also in history from the University of Chicago. He began teaching at UC Santa Cruz in 1995. His first book, A Discipline of the Foot, Inventing Japanese Native Ethnography, 1910 to 1945, is about the formation of modern Japanese folklore studies as a social science, exploring in particular the relationship between the field's leading theoreticians and their informants in the countryside. At present, he is working on a book on a wartime malaria disaster in Okinawa and a reparations campaign that emerged in the early 1990s. The book is provisionally titled Mass Murder by Mosquito, Science, War, and Memory, in the Yayama Islands. I've invited Alan to talk about the collaborative his public history project called the Gale Project, an Okinawan American dialogue of which he is the project director. You can learn more from their website, galeproject.ucsc.edu. Welcome, Alan, to KCSC's Voces Criticas. Thank you very much. Let's begin with talking about the U.S. military occupation in Okinawa. How extensive is it today in 2017? The uh, overall forces of the United States and Japan are about 50,000 troops. They have about 40,000 dependents living with them, and there are another 5,000-plus contractors. So the total number of troops in Japan overall is close to 100,000. It's the largest of the base complexes uh, in the world. Korea is very close to that. Number of soldiers, the troops in Okinawa is 27,000. So that sounds like it's about half of the number of troops total. But the number of installations in Okinawa amount to about 74% of all the bases in that are located in Japan. Okinawa constitutes 0.6% of the land mass total of Japan. So having 74% of all the bases in Japan, uh, the largest base complex located on that tiny island, is a significant presence. And Okinawans will tell you that, of course, you need to build bases largely on flat land, which is arable land. And so uh, the bases occupy about 20% of the, the land mass of Okinawa. So it's, it's uh, hard to avoid in Okinawa. As a scholar of modern Japan, how much does the past war haunt the present? I talk to the students when I teach War Memory with Alice Yang about the ways that we use language to situate ourselves relevant to wars. You know, and I, I say in Japan, they call the present moment the post-war. And of course, the war that they're post is 1945, the World War II. And in the United States, I ask them which post-war are we in now? And of course, we're not actually in a post-war. We are in a war time, right? In in Japan, for several times over the past 70 years, there have been a number of times in which people thought, is the post-war over? We're about to end, enter a new era in which no longer will we really define ourselves in relationship to that war, but some other new uh, enterprise will be the definition. And each time that was proposed, it turned out to not be really successful. I would say still today, if you ask Japanese which era did they live in, they would say post-war. In Okinawa, they would say that the war hasn't ended yet. The battles aren't continuing, but the military base presence is unavoidable. Uh, Along with the base presence comes things like crime, accidents, pollution, and other forms of risk. And so, you know, the the presence, the the haunting presence of the war is, is powerful in Okinawa. There are other ways to talk about that, and of course that would have to do with how it's it's remembered, so not, not not just whether it's it's felt as an immediate presence. And there I would say that in Japan, as a nation, the primary way in which the war haunts the present is probably through the post-war constitution, which has Article 9, in which the Japanese government uh, forswears the right to engage in war as a sovereign right of the state. This is known as the peace constitution, and it's currently a hotly contested issue. The current prime minister would like to revise the constitution and remove that clause so that Japan could, could have a, a standing army without any constraints. Hiroshima and Nagasaki it's a huge issue, right? Unique experiences in World War II and of the atomic bombs. And so you go to those two cities and you feel that presence in, in a very different way. It's not a, a strictly political issue. It's a, it's a lived issue in some ways. And then Okinawa, because it had the last land battle, another very strong relationship with the war that a quarter to a third of the population died. So there's not a person in Okinawa who doesn't have a family member that who, who they lost. Many families have no possessions that date prior to 1945 because everything was destroyed in the battle. And so a connection with a deeper past is denied to them in that sense. And then the landscape is just marked everywhere with memorials of the battle. So in, in Okinawa in particular, the memory of the, of the war uh, remains uh, a powerful uh, haunting of the present. 
Who is Charles Eugene Gale, the namesake for this public history project? Charles Eugene Gale was a dentist who grew up in San Bernardino, went to a dentistry school at the University of Southern California on a ROTC scholarship during World War II. He didn't finish school before World War II ended, uh, so he entered the Army Reserve at that point in time. And in 1953, he was called up to serve uh, in a hospital on Okinawa, uh, we believe at the uh, Tori Station base, which is uh, the army base that has a hospital in Okinawa. I say we believe because in 1973, there was a fire at the National Archives Military Personnel Records storage warehouse that uh, destroyed a, a lot of records. And when we requested his records, when his daughter requested his records, uh, we got back a, a charred piece of a fragment of paper is all they have left. So we weren't able to to absolutely confirm this. But uh, as a dentist, he went to Okinawa and spent a year there um, from December of 52 through December of 1953. And while he was there, he was uh, an amateur cameraman who really, I think, had artistic aspirations. And as a dentist, he had access to uh, photographic developing equipment. So he had a camera, he had film, and he spent a lot of his free time wandering the island as he could, um, taking pictures. And so the namesake of the the project is is a man who was a a serviceman who took pictures in Okinawa and and left some really fantastic pieces. So from those pictures, can you dissect cipher the kind of maybe relationship he had with the with the local people that's a it's a good question there's there are a lot of photos of people he has landscapes he has some technology particularly coastal light you know boats and whatnot but there are a lot of one of the things that's striking about the collection is the number of really good portraits he's done of people and he was using one of those cameras where you 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 line up your shot by looking down from above into the the viewfinder right and so that creates a different kind of relationship with the person that you're, that you're uh, shooting the pictures of so you can see lots of evidence of indirect evidence but evidence to some degree of how they're engaging with him and of course one of the things that has been really interesting to me with these photos from the very beginning is, you know, we're interested in how this American photographer chose these kinds of scenes as things to use his precious supply of film to take pictures of, what is drawing his eye to these things. But we're also really interested in what it was like to be in Okinawa and confronted in the midst of your daily life by this uniformed American soldier eight years after the war had ended. So it really is interesting to look at those photos of people and think, you know, what's the what's the human interaction that's going on at this moment? They look good. That may be because that's what he left for us. There are a couple photos where you can see fear, particularly in uh, schoolgirls. One of the things that drew American eyes was, uh, and this is true in many Asian countries, siblings, children took care of their younger siblings, strap them on their back and carry them around, right? Lots of pictures, not just from Charles Gale, but from other place, other other photographers of this phenomenon of children carrying, carrying children. So there's some of those photos where he's got children, uh, he's taken pictures of children. You can see that they're a little bit scared and not hard to understand. Why did his daughter, Jer- is it Jerry Gale? Jerry. Why did she pick the UC Santa Cruz Special Collections for these photo archives? Is, is there some kind of connection to UC Santa Cruz? Yeah, Jerry was a campus auditor. And so she was a member of the UC Santa Cruz family. And as she was retiring, she approached Shelby Graham, who's the director of the Cessna Gallery over at their Porter to say, you know, her father had died, I think it was in 2003, and she wanted to do a show in memory of his his art at the point when she herself was retiring. So she took the photos to to Jerry and said, you know, do you think these are of artistic merit? He had been doing photography throughout his life. He went on shoots, was in shows with Ansel Adams, did lots of shoots in the Sierra Nevadas and whatnot. But it turns out that these photos that he took in Okinawa during that one year were the ones that he thought were his best photos. And he kept them with with him his whole life. They were decorating his dentist office back in the United States when he came home and whatnot. So she chose those photos in particular because of, of the you know, the power they had for her father and her as well. And I think she was also motivated by, you know, this, she, she was learning about Okinawa and thinking, you know, this is a place that we have a deep connection to, and yet many people have very little understanding of what there is there. So she approached Shelby and she said, uh, could we do a show of my father's photos here? And Shelby looked at them and said, yeah, these, are, these have artistic merit. Let's find out if there's some kind of historical interest to them as well. And, and that's when I became involved. So what year was this when you became involved in, in terms of becoming the project director? So I'm a historian. I'm very bad with this kind of question. (laughs) I first encountered the photos in, I'm going to say it's about 2010. 
could have been 2011 when I was involved in a project, uh, in another project at the time. And so I looked at the photos, I said, these are great. As soon as I am, am available, I'd love to do this. So I think I really got started with the photos in 2013. And that's when I, I took the photos with me. I had a little research trip I was doing to Okinawa. In Okinawa, I took digitized uh, scans of the photos with me and showed them to some archivists and museum professionals there and said, do you think there's any interest in a, in a show of these in Okinawa? And the response was enthusiastic. And that's, that's when I began to step up the, the activity. So then you've been the only project director for the Yale Project. I'm the primary project director. The project is run through the Center for the Study of Pacific War Memory, which is uh, co-directed by Alice Yang and myself. She's also a historian of the U.S. Shelby Graham is really the artistic director. I, as a historian, and particularly the historian who I am, have no business <laughs> running an exhibition. My former graduate student, Dustin Wright, who has finished his Ph.D. in 2015 and is now teaching in um, in Connecticut served an important role while I was on, on leave as a director. And then I think of Tosh Tanaka, who's a, also a staff member on campus here and a, a fabulous ph photographer as being a director, a media director of the project. So let's talk about the students, because I know you had a, a number of undergraduate students who became research collaborators for the Gale Project. Right. So tell me a little bit more about the role that the students played. I've been trying to do some experiments, pedagogical experiments in the classroom over the last uh, seven years or so, in which I get students involved in research projects with me in a way that I, I hope will be closer to the professional experience of doing research than will often happen in a seminar when we're, we're encouraging them to do research in, in some ways. But, you know, one of the things that I, for example, learned late at graduate school was, oh, you need to raise money to do this kind of work. So fundraising, project development, all those kinds of things, right? It had really been gnawing at me for a while that when we teach history, we often give them books that have the the final end of a research project. We ask them to read the books and learn about history that way. And what they're learning is a series of facts and, and narratives, but they're not necessarily learning the process unless you reverse engineer it. So it began to feel to me like sometimes we could do a class in which we could introduce them to a research project that we don't know the outcome yet and have them participate in that process that way. So the students are working with me through, uh, we've gathered um, in three trips to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., about 9,000 documents of the American military rule in Okinawa. So we're managing those documents. They develop uh, research questions out of the photos themselves. They do some web design, graphic design for different parts of the project. And I have a group of students who are especially interested right now in producing a podcast. So they get to think about gathering primary sources, raising questions, doing project development, but also dissemination, either via an exhibition or via a podcast or some other medium. That's fabulous. So tell me about the various pieces to the Gelp projects. I know there's a traveling exhibit. There's right. obviously the digital components. There's the physical archives. So if you could explain the different pieces, that would sure. be great. Well, when Shelby first brought me the photos with, with Jerry uh, to ask if there was any historical interest, uh, the photos are not eventful. These are not, there are no pictures of strikes or marches or anything like that. They're very daily life kind of things. But they're also taken at a moment just before the Americans expanded the, the land appropriations for base construction in 1950. From 54 to 56, they expanded the bases 1,000%. So there was a huge land appropriation that happened just after these photos were taken that transformed everything. And so one of my first thoughts was, everything is about to change after these photos were taken. And another one was that Okinawans have one of the longest life expectancies in the world. And if we take these photos to Okinawa, we have an opportunity to do a photographic show in which the photographic subjects could speak back to us. If not the people themselves, then there are people alive today with whom, in, within whom these people in the photographs are living memories. So I thought, what would be really exciting to do with this show would be start a show here at the Cessna Gallery and then travel it to Okinawa and let Okinawans come to the show and tell us what they're seeing in the photos. And we could generate an oral history project perhaps out of that. The project really does begin with this traveling exhibition as a means to be able to engage a broader public and not just Okinawans, of course, because if you have 50,000 Americans stationed there and they've been stationed there since 1945, I don't know, we haven't yet calculated how many have rotated through Okinawa over the decades, but it, you know, it has to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And in that sense, you have a place that has a lot of Americans who've had experiences there, a lot of Okinawans. And we are hoping that we can use these photos traveling around to different places to begin to elicit a, a public response to these via oral histories. So the traveling exhibition starts here, and then we're going to travel it to Okinawa and uh, do a show there. And then we want to follow the Okinawan diaspora. So that would include places like Osaka, Japan, and Honolulu, Los Angeles, and Sao Paulo and perhaps to Bolivia as well, and then come back to Santa Cruz at the end of all that. So the traveling exhibition, you know, is a means to pry open 
a conversation with people about their experiences of the post-war, about uh, the presence of the American military, or about being an American military person in Okinawa. And so uh, along with the exhibition, we have this, we're developing a webpage that will allow us to collect oral histories that could begin with observations about the photos, something like, that's me <laughs> and my name is. We had a conversation with somebody a while ago who said, saw all the children without shoes. And she said, this is an American who had grown up in the base. She said, you know, I remember that we used to give shoes to the maids. That was the gift that everyone gave because none of their kids had shoes. And it was just a little observation from the photos that was actually quite telling of the relationship, I thought. But these people who, who could tell us stories are all over the country and we can't travel to them. So the website was originally conceived as a place to enable people from all kinds of places to come to the site, to see the photos, to click on a button and turn on the microphone on their computer and to tell us a story. So we have the web uh, presence in that sense. And it's been a long haul to build the technology for that. We're pretty happy with how far we've come. And the opening of the show has unleashed a lot of communications. We're having, in fact, a group of 12 Okinawan Americans coming up from San Diego this weekend to tell us their stories. So now we're starting to look more seriously at how do we really develop the the oral history dimension. And then finally, as I mentioned, we have this this document collection that we've gathered, which the students are, are getting a really deep look at, at some of the, you know, the, the means, methods, ideologies of, of, of rule in Okinawa. And the National Archives digitizes what it can, but uh, this is not one of those high priorities. And so if you're interested in studying Okinawan history, you either have to go to Washington, D.C., or you have to go to Okinawa, where they made copies of these things. And so we thought it would be really interesting to be able to digitize these photos and make them available for researchers uh, through our site. So we also have that element as well. You're listening to Alan Christie, Associate Professor of History, specializing in modern Japan. He's also Provost of Kawa College and the Project Director of the Gale Project, an Okinawan American dialogue. So obviously the project emphasizes the word dialogue in the subtitle. And I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what you're hoping these dialogues accomplish in terms of maybe new understandings in the Okinawan American relations. Yes, if, if you see the news these days, you know that it's a, a time of high tension in Okinawa for a variety of reasons. Of course, the primary reason is Okinawans would like the bases removed, ideally reduced, if at all possible. And of course, uh, right now, the Americans and Japanese uh, government are in the process of building a brand new base on top of a coral reef. It's uh, really a beautiful place, pretty pristine, and it's causing a great deal of of trouble. Okinawans are protesting this in ever-increasing voices and ever-increasing frustration. I remember being there in 2013 and talking with somebody and again getting an email from her that night saying, I need you to go down to a movie theater downtown to watch a documentary film there. I need you to do this because this is how you'll understand what we're dealing with today. And it was a documentary film called Target Village. And it's about a village where they're building a heliport base. And it was a lot about bringing in the Ospreys as well. And the film shows the protesters going through every possible means they can to express their resistance to this and to express through particularly democratic means in a democratic society that this is not something they want to have here. And they get turned aside at every point. And at the end of the movie, the, one of the, the leaders of this movement, who is uh, just a farmer and a coffee shop owner, you know, looks at the camera person and just says, what is it going to take for people to hear us? And, and that was the thing that really that really hit me. I, I, I'm not here to speak for Okinawans, but I, you know, I have the privilege to have a, a platform that I could help Okinawans speak about what their frustrations are. In return, I think, you know, Americans who have been there have a lot of things to say about Okinawa, about what Okinawa has meant to them, much of it very positive. But in general, you know, Americans, uh, because bases are overseas, it's very hard for us to pay attention to them, to remember that they have an impact on other people. I'm not trying to find compromise or to find, you know, a, a place where we can settle everything. I think the dialogue, it's about visibility so that we can begin to actually approach policy from a, a place of intentionality. And some empathy and some compassion as well. Absolutely. How do you situate the Gale Project in a regional context? In other words, can the Gale Project lead us to sort of new understandings about other parts of, for instance, the Pacific or other parts of the world? Yeah, absolutely. I'm teaching a class right now called the Nuclear Pacific in which we think about the ways that nuclear weapons and nuclear power have been a, a powerfully determining uh, factor in the region. Okinawans themselves are making very strong arguments about the connection of Okinawan bases to, for example, bases being built in Jeju Island, which is to the southeast of Korea, part of Korea, but like Okinawa, a place that has been culturally distinct and somewhat discriminated against. They point to Guam, they point to Hawaii, they point to the Marshall Islands. 
and Okinawa is the keystone of the Pacific for the American military. It's the most important base. And it's through that place that we can think about a broader set of questions about an American military presence in the Pacific. You know, one of the things that when I've talked about the bases and the problems there with people in the United States, often people remember very quickly the crimes that American soldiers commit. And, and those are terrible crimes and they're clearly a major problem. And I worry sometimes that when people talk about those crimes, there's almost a sense that if, well, if we could stop the crime, maybe then we wouldn't be causing problems. And I, I, I keep trying to get people to understand that it's not the crimes are bad, the pollution is bad, the accidents are bad. But if you commit, if you created bases that had none of those things, you'd still have a problem. And that's the fact that Okinawa is a target. So at the North Korean crisis right now, of course, what the Okinawans have been saying all along is if you have bases here, war will come to us inevitably. And that's in the f most fundamental sense you know, a deep cause of the, of the resistance to the bases. I imagine a great cause of anxiety there as well. Thank you so much, Alan, for coming on the show. I learned a great deal oh, about the project. Me. And you can learn more at galeproject.ucsc.edu. Thank you so much. Thank you.